Good morning. I'm Matt Robinson. I'm a, a life scientist with the EPA Chesapeake Bay Program Office in Annapolis. Um, and uh, I just helped uh, Mr. Leggett here put this session today, along with D.D. Strum is joining us from the Blacks of the Chesapeake Foundation. Uh, Mr. Leggett is the president of the Blacks of the Chesapeake Foundation. He's going to serve as our uh, uh, facilitator for this session. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, team. And I welcome everyone to this Zoom. And we have a great session plan and great panelists serving underserved communities in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Again, my name is Vince Leggett. I'm the founder and president of the Blacks of the Chesapeake and also carry the honorary title Admiral of the Chesapeake Bay mm -hmm. for continuing to uh, carry the flag and try to build the next generation of champions on the Chesapeake Bay to continue to work each and every one of us have been committed to. I'm proud here today to be among a distinguished group of diverse stakeholders from across the Chesapeake Bay watershed. All of the stakeholders represent a unique interest in restoration of the bay and the watershed. And it's my hope that all the participants, whether you are speaking or just listening in on this session, will leave today with an understanding of how important it is to listen to diverse perspectives on watershed restoration. In 2014, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement acknowledges the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And a big part of that is to have everyone working collectively to improve the water quality of the Bay, and also make sure that we have all stakeholders engaged. What I do believe is that unless we have all stakeholders engaged, we do not maximize the investments that have been put into the Bay restoration efforts. In 2020, the Chesapeake Executive Council signed a statement in support of DEIJ, again, diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion, recognizing that individually each partner has established policies and programs within the goal of advancing environmental and public health protection for all. The statement also recognizes there's more that must be done as we unite in partnership. And for this reason, it's necessary for the Chesapeake Bay program explicitly and tangibly to commit to DEIJ. The Chesapeake program has been working diligently to meet the goals of the statement through its DG, DEIJ work group. However, there's always room for improvement. We'll hear some of the strategies and suggestions. Today, we'll be holding a conversation. I'll call it a fireside chat, but we will also be listening. And it's my hope that this will be the first of many opportunities for our partners to tell how representatives underserved communities and what they need to do to meet local restoration goals and the larger goals of the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership. I would like to start with a brief introduction of each one of our panelists. Uh, Abel Olivo, co-founder and executive director of the Defense in the CUNAR, which translates to Watershed Defenders, a nonprofit dedicated to engaging Latino and Spanish speakers in watershed related issues and experiences. A community activist in Prince George's County, Maryland, Mr. Olivo uses his insights and perspectives as a former lobbyist and advocate to connect the resources and relationships through coalition building, strategic partnerships for the community. Mr. Olivo has extensive experience in developing and implementing policy and engagement campaigns which maximize reach, impact, and message. The son of an immigrant farm workers and the first in his family to graduate from college. Olivo earned a BA in political science from Ohio State University. He now lives in Chevrolet, Maryland with his wife, Amy, and their two sons. Mr. Olivo also serves as a member of the Chesapeake Bay Program Stakeholder Advisory Committee. Mr. Olivo, can you just make a statement on why you think this is important, how it connects to your work? Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Leggett, for the introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it and the opportunity to chat with you in this fireside format. Um, yeah, I think that the work that we do, the work that we all do is super important to bring access to the communities that are most impacted by these policies that they had nothing to do with. Uh, when we think about how and where we live as communities of color, Latinos and Spanish speakers, 
we are most impacted by land use policies. We have, and, and those outcomes, um, those co-determinants of health really have tremendous impacts on our lives. So it's really important that we take a look at the work that we do, uh, the decisions that are made and who's making them and, and inviting those folks who are not at the table to the table. And those all begin with a simple invitation. Um, we're asking people to go from zero to advocate when we talk about um, policy and uh, decision-making process. There is so much work to do to, to fill that gap, that chasm. And, and that's why it's important that, that we all do the work to um, equitably engage uh, communities that, that haven't been engaged. And what, what is your favorite color? Uh, red. <laughs> red. Okay. Next, next member of the dream team is uh, Ms. Angie Rosser. She's the executive director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Mrs. Rosser joined the West Virginia Rivers Coalition as executive director in 2012, bringing a background of working in West Virginia on social justice issues and in the nonprofit sector. Her experience involves policy advocacy community organizing and coalition building. Her motivation for clean water advocacy is personal. She wants to be able to swim in her own backyard river. Her motivation is also political. She believes everyone has a right to enjoy clean water and that conservation of our water resources is central to a shared prosperity. And she holds a BA in anthropology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and an MA in organizational communications from West Virginia University. Can you tell us how your work and your lived experience connect to our themes today? Thank you, Beth, and greetings from West Virginia, uh, many of your headwaters uh, all together. 19 million people rely on water that flows out of West Virginia as a drinking water source. And we are also home to um, many rural low-income communities that have been underserved for some time. And the Chesapeake Bay Program and these kind of conversations highlight the opportunities and the successes and the progress being made that when we focus watershed wide on uh, something like a, the Bay Restoration, we also have the opportunity for localized benefits that have compounding benefits. So. The projects that we're seeing in West Virginia develop um, in a thoughtful manner are, are showing that local communities through successful restoration can also have an uh, increase in local living resources, uh, more access to safe recreation, uh, safe drinking water, flooding uh, mitigation, all of these things play together uh, through these coordinated efforts that otherwise are our underserved rural communities would not have access to. And your favorite color? Oh, I'm on, I'm green. Although a famous frog say, said something like it's not easy being green. <laughs> I relate to that in West Virginia, but I'm green all the way. Go green. Uh, uh, the third member of our dream team is uh, Julie Lawson. She's chair of the Chesapeake Program Stakeholders Advisory Committee. Mrs. Lawson has over 25 years of experience as a coalition builder, an entrepreneur advocate, a marketing profession, and project manager. She has developed multiple local, state, and national coalitions to pass cutting edge legislation and programs to protect neighborhoods and waterways from the Anacostia River to the oceans. Julie currently serves as the coordinator for education and workforce development strategies for the DC District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment. Previously, Julie served on the cabinet of DC's Merle, Mayor Merle Bowser as the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Clean City. She is also the founding executive director of Trash Free Maryland a nonprofit organization working to reduce trash pollution through policy and behavioral change. Can you just give us a word on how your lived experience and professional experience reinforce our theme of the day's session? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really got into this work because like Amy, I want to be able to swim in the river in my backyard, the Anacostia River, and recognizing how we get more people to take advantage and protect the places that they care about. I realized that trash was something that everyone cares about, whether you're worried about microplastics and saving the whales, or you're worried about how your neighborhood looks and feels from litter on the street. Um, so <clears throat> trash and the Anacostia River have been my driving force. I'm proud to serve as the chair of the Stakeholders Advisory Committee and all of the great work that we are doing as a, a volunteer body to advance the Bay Program's DEIJ objectives, um, representing voices of two dozen stakeholders from across the region, uh, the watershed, sharing their perspectives and their priorities for uh, both Bay restoration and just general quality of life among all of our representatives and our um, the residents of our watershed. So I'm glad to be here and look forward to the discussion. And your favorite color? Purple. Purple, oh, okay. Uh, next member of the dream team is um, Samantha Phillips Beers. She's the director of the EPA Region 3 Office of Communities, Tribes, and Environmental Assessment. Mrs. Phillips Beers directs EPA Region 3 staff responsibility, working with all communities and federally recognized tribes in the region, children's health and environmental education and environmental assessments. Mrs. Phillips Beers has been with EPA since 1991 and was previously with Region 3's Office of Compliance and Environmental Justice and Office of Region Council. She earned a BS degree in political science from Haverford College and a law degree, JD degree, from the University of California, Berkeley, Bolt Hall School of Law. Uh, Mrs. Philip Beers, can you tell how your lived experience and professional background intersects with our thematics for today? Well, thank you so much for asking me to be on the panel and being able to share a couple of thoughts. As you read out loud, I've been doing environmental justice support since the mid 90s. And it's really uh, with the intersection of public health and environmental issues come to fruition. Um, I really dedicated a lot of my career to the concepts of fairness and equity. So where we eat, live, pray, play, go to school or work, we all have a right to enjoy the natural bounty. None of us should have a higher than our share of pollution or ill effects. You know, in order for us as a country to do well, all ships have to rise and we have to really create a new basement. So it, it, as you read, I used to be a, a lawyer in the Office of Regional Council, and then I was the director of the Office of Enforcement Compliance and Environmental Justice starting in 1997, and then segued over to Communities, Tribes, and Environmental Assessment, which is the NEPA program in, in 2019. So I've dedicated my entire professional life to thinking about our underserved communities. We have a really exciting opportunity in the Biden administration because of the three executive orders signed by President Biden, not just executive orders, but putting money where your mouth is. All the funding in, in ARP, BLL, and IRA are all designed to go to community, underserved communities and raise the basement. So I'm here today to share a little bit more about that mission to support everyone else here on this panel as they fulfill their mission and to move us forward as a united group. So, and my favorite color is guess what? Black. Black is okay. always good. No matter what the season is, we're black. Thank you, thank you. And the next member of the dream team is Patrick Walsh. He's an economist, EPA National Center for Environmental Economics. At the EPA, Mr. Walsh provides economic analysis and guides on policies related to land contamination, remediation, water quality, and climate change in NEPA review. From 2016 to 2021, he was a senior economist for the Manakee Wunu Land Care Research, a New Zealand Crown Research Institute. At Manika Winu, Patrick led a team of economists that specialized in environmental, agricultural, and natural resources economics research with applications on indigenous climate adaptation and Kiwi conservation. Much of his research is on the benefit cost analysis, valuation, and environmental policy, with more recent work in interdisciplinary topics 
in species conservation, the distribution of benefits and behavioral economics. Mr. Walsh, can you weigh in? Sure, thank you for having me on this panel. It's an honor to serve with the rest of these distinguished guests. Um, yeah, as, as you said, my office does a lot of work on benefit cost analysis for the EPA and evaluating environmental regulations. And you know, billions of dollars have been spent on um, restoration efforts by federal, state, and local organizations. And there was a past collaboration between my office and the Chesapeake Bay program uh, that attempted to estimate the benefits of the TMDL in dollar terms. And so we did a bunch of research on um, looking at property price impacts, recreational commercial fishing impacts, um, non-use values. And those studies found that the TMDL would yield billions of benefits annually but um, while we looked at total benefits uh, of the TMDL, there were a lot of unanswered questions about the distribution of those benefits. You know, this is common in federal cost benefit analysis to just look at the total number. Um, you know, so for instance, a lot of the estimated property price benefits would accrue to you know, higher income coastal communities. And so with a lot of those unanswered questions on the table, um, we've had a desire to loop back on this project, and we've engaged now in a new project with the Chesapeake Bay Program Office, um, where we're trying to address some of the distributional implications um, of Chesapeake Bay restoration. We're still in the early stages, um, but we're looking at a variety of um, interesting questions that are highly relevant to a lot of these other um, speakers' topics, um, you know, recreation preferences and how they differ across communities, access to the bay, access to cleanup programs um, and related issues. And Anne will uh, talk a little bit more about some of our initial efforts uh, in this project. But yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Favorite color? Uh, favorite color in, in line with others. I am wearing it as blue. <laughs> OK. And uh, rounding out our dream team is Ms. Ann Wolverton. She is a senior research economist EPA National Center for Environmental Economics. At EPA, Mrs. Walsh heads a team tasked with reviewing environmental justice analysis conducted for major rulemakings. She also leads a team building economy-wide modeling capacity for the agency and has been involved in developing EPA technical guidance for conducting economic analysis and for the analysis of environmental justice concerns and interagency efforts to develop social costs of carbon estimates for the use of federal regulatory analysis. She served as a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors from 2006 to 2007, and they brought her back again from 2009 to 2010. She received her PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin. Let's, let's hear from you, Mrs. Wolverton. Thank you, Vince. I really appreciate that welcome. And um, it's an honor to serve on the panel with all these other folks. Um, as Patrick mentioned, I was gonna talk just very briefly about a project that we have underway um, that we're just initiating. Um, my, my background and my time spent at the EPA has um, kind of woven in and out of environmental justice throughout my career. Um, and uh, this opportunity that presented itself with the Chesapeake Bay Program Office allows me to kind of think about and apply some of um, my interests uh, within the watershed, and I'm really looking forward to that. So as Patrick mentioned, we've got this new project underway, and um, I wanted to describe just briefly some of the initial um, uh, thoughts about it. Uh, in order to hopefully provide some fodder for discussion. So to begin, we're planning a series of focus groups. Um, we wanna better understand how overburdened and underrepresented communities within the watershed interact with the Bay. We wanna reach a diverse set of households, including focus groups targeted to communities vulnerable to the effects of climate change and inundation inland and near shore populations that might face additional barriers to information funding or implementation of bay improvement projects um, and, um, and some others as well. Um, for example, farmers who might play an important role in restoring the bay. 
we want to organize these conversations around four broad themes. So one is understanding how people interact with the watershed and their future vision for restoring the health and welfare of the Bay. Uh, two is what aspects of Bay improvements are important to them. Three is what barriers make it more difficult to enjoy the Bay's amenities or to take advantage of funding opportunities to restore it. And four is how Bay restoration impacts them in both inland and near shore areas. Collaboration with trusted local organizations to help recruit and even facilitate the focus groups is going to be essential uh, to that process. Our goal is to use these conversations to ensure that subsequent research is responsive to the issues and concerns that matter most to the, the Bay communities and that it results in real improvements in the way projects are prioritized and implemented going forward. Uh, and we'll also use um, the findings from the focus groups to inform and um, uh, tailor any follow-up research to, um, you know, the particular types of issues that are raised. Thank you. And your favorite color? Oh, green. I'm also wearing my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks each and every one of you for joining and thank everyone out there in Zoom land. Uh, we have more than 100 people with us today, and so this is a, a hot topic. We have until 1230, and my role is to serve as the air traffic controller that uh, just trying to get the planes in and out of the airport, the panelists, the people flying in with questions, observations, or if you will, disagree with anything you hear. Uh, we're really going to try to have a robust and respectful uh, conversation this afternoon. For me, uh, I grew up in East Baltimore and I described myself as a country boy from East Baltimore. And once everyone stopped snickering and laughing and saying there's nothing country in East Baltimore, I say, here I am. And the reason I asked about the different colors is that in elementary school, the way that I remembered the colors of the rainbow was Roy G. Biv. I just kept on saying, my mama just banged that in my head. Vince, just remember Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv. And I, I scored Roy high, but that was not a question on the SAT. But I just wanted to just show you all just how versatile I am. <laughs> what I would also say that for you on the Zoom land, out there in chat land, if you uh, have a question or something, just raise your hand. Panelists, just kind of raise your hand. Matters with me here to help try to get people in and out of the airport uh, safely without planes crashing and stepping on each other. But what I'd like to do is just start out with an observation that I would like for each one of the panelists to share from my 30 years of lived experience. And I've worked with every alphabet organization on the Chesapeake Bay for 30 years and have also been a community leader around Blacks of the Chesapeake. What I've found is that many times the circus comes to town, local, federal, state, NGOs has a big splash, but when the circus packs up and leaves town are the communities, the black, the browns, the limited resource communities of any color, hue or creed, are they any better off? And I think that that is a big part of the challenge that faces us. How do we maintain the maximum return on dollars for investments made in communities? How do we build capacity to carry on the work that many of us start? And I'll give each one of the panelists a chance to uh, just tap into that challenge. Uh, what do we do when the circus leaves town? Are we trying to build ca capacity and community? And do you think that's important? You want us to go in order, or, or do, how would you let, like let, to do? Let's try reverse order. Oh, you're putting me on the hot seat. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, meaningful engagement with communities is is critical to ensuring that any program that is implemented to improve the bay, either the water quality or the amenities, and the way that people access and interact with it is you know, best serving those who have to live there every day. Um, and 
I think there's been a renewed interest and attention on the importance of that at the federal level. Um, we're at the EPA trying to figure out how to do this well in a way that isn't represent a burden to the communities um, where they're just you know giving information, but then it's not directly coming back to them in, in some sort of concrete beneficial way. But the project that Patrick and I described, one of the questions are really interested in is where have the dollars gone to date for the different types of projects and where where are they matched well to the needs of the community and where are there some missed opportunities where we could think about um, you know going forward ways to better um, tailor projects to the needs of the community. Um, one example of that that we're interested in where there are actually some data that we can use um, is on best management practices for farmers and thinking about, you know, what was recommended for particular communities, what was ultimately implemented and what was not, why were they not implemented? Um, are there information barriers where um, certain communities aren't even aware that these opportunities exist and there isn't necessarily a, a level playing field for being able to apply for project dollars that could be um, you know, used directly in those communities. Those are some of the kinds of questions that we're particularly interested in. And hopefully those will feed directly back into the Bay program and the way that they prioritize and implement projects going forward. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. Um, yeah, following along on um, what Ann said, um, we, we hope that this project we're working on can um, really affect other things that EPA does. We've gotten uh, a lot of conversations going with the Office of Water to better tailor things beyond this project. Um, you know, so for instance, I, I, look, I mentioned previously that there's a lot of benefit cost analysis going on that just looks at total benefits. Um, but now the Biden administration just released a new circular A4 um, that um, guides federal agencies to look at distributional impacts of their benefits. And so we hope that we can lay some uh, good frameworks for how to do that um, using this project, or at least recognize some gaps in our current things. So, you know, hopefully that can improve things that are done later on so that when the circus leaves town, we're still kind of doing this. We've got executive orders in place that will hopefully support that, and, and uh, as well as some OMB guidance. Thank you. Mr. Philip Beers? So I want to give you two quick examples because we're all on tight time frames and I want to get this out. Number one, thank you for talking about it this way because I've been too many times in the last 28 years have I seen feds or states rein in, make a lot of promises and walk away. We're never been part of that out of my office and my shop. We go in and we stay in, we build relationships that we can keep. Quick example, uh, in the mid nineties, we started doing work with the Chester community in Pennsylvania. Uh, long history uh, there about the ninth proposed permit in a community that was underserved with higher than their share of everything from poverty, low education, housing with lead paint, children with lead in their blood, and et cetera. Um, in order to build capacity and maintain capacity, we helped found the Chester Environmental Partnership. We have attended meetings once a month for 21 years in that community. We go and we stay. We're part of the long haul. Um, I've done that in other communities. And here's the second part I wanted to refresh folks' recollection on. Um, Executive Order 14008, signed by President Biden on January 27th of 2021, stated that 40% of all the funding coming from the federal government needed to go into underserved communities as defined by the CGES tool. That, that money is five-year money. So despite, you know, we, we're about to enter silly season, some would argue we're already in silly season now. With that said, the money will outlast this administration, whether or not the administration continues. We can all have personal decisions on that one. Um, and it's there to ensure that some capacity has some legs on it. So the CGES tool is a yes, no tool that'll be used, unlike EJ screen, to determine whether or not it's an underserved community solely for the purpose of where of deciding on the listing column of where the money's gone. Think about how to partner between those community-based organizations and local government, state government, or, or companies to put together issues and concerns you have, use that government funding to go ahead and get answers to some of your questions. So I have a personal history of setting up long-term relationships and I lean on that side. 
And then there's the professional issue under this executive order that allows for longer than a, a, a bump and serve. It's a bump and stay. So let's all make best use of that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julie Lawson. Yeah, I appreciate all of the um, input so far from our federal partners. I'm just uh, thinking, you know, in my role on the CAC, um, and to clarify for folks, um, the it's been formally known as the Citizens Advisory Committee, and we spent a year with our members working through consensus uh, to decide that we wanted to align with the edits to the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement that removed the word citizen last year. Um, after a year of work with our members, we reached consensus to change our name and have changed it to stakeholders in order to be more inclusive and better represent who we are on our committee. Um, that's not actually official until the executive council approves it in October. So we may go back and forth a little bit between those two words. Um, but one of the roles that I, you know, last week was the Chesapeake Bay Program's biennial meeting. It was the first time we'd gathered in person, a hundred of us in a room for, in, since before the pandemic. Um, and it was fantastic. And a lot of that work was looking at where do we go beyond 2025, which is the, in theory, deadline for achieving our restoration goals for the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the points that I ha kept hammering home was that we need to be, we need to recognize that we are borrowing from future generations and that the people who will be implementing this restoration plan are young. They're far more diverse than most of the people who are in the room right now. And that their voices need to be included and even prioritized as we develop these plans looking forward because they will be the ones implementing it after many of us are retired and taking care of grandkids, et cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, really wanting to uh, uplift those voices and make sure that they are part of the planning for the future uh, to define, uh, decide to see a vision of the Bay of the future and not just restoring to get to the Bay of the past, which, you know, I look forward to our robust future pelt industry, right? Um, so, um, you know, I also want to, put my day job hat back on and I work in partnership with um, the University of the District of Columbia to support Anacostia High School, which has two career academies, one for public leadership and one for civil engineering and architecture. And we work with a number of students in both of those academies on environmental and social justice projects, um, doing a lot of urban agriculture work, um, park ranger training, uh, partnerships with the Department of Interior to do community community asset mapping. And one of them, one of the sophomores saw me yesterday and he came up to me and gave me a big hug. And he's like, I don't get to work on Kingman Island this summer. I have to go work for Department of Interior to do this community mapping project. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I, you know, you could talk to your folks at DOI about field trips to Kingman and you could go tell all the kids working on Kingman this summer how great a summer you had last year. And then he hugged me again. He's like, I'm gonna miss you guys so much. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going anywhere. But to see how excited these kids are about getting out into nature, participating in um, boat rides and removing invasive plants and planting seeds and then seeing them grow and harvesting from the hydroponic system in their school. Um, and then knowing that we can then help them get into colleges of their choice to pursue this as a career. I'm really hopeful that we can come back to that first point I made and have a lot of vibrant, young, diverse voices ready to lead us into the next uh, facet of our Bay work. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Rossa? Yeah, so, you know, you painted the picture of the circus coming to town and I, I, can, I can think many West Virginians can relate to that of outsiders coming in or the federal government coming in making promises and just not delivering and we are still you know bottom of the bucket for um pretty much any health indicator or economic indicator so what's changed what's changing what's changed i do I mean something that I, I think is very tangible in our rural communities that region three is focused on and the chesapeake bay program has provided opportunities is uh, water infrastructure, 
Um, there's been examples in the Bay watershed in our rural communities where the uh, wastewater treatment investment have hooked people up to sanitation. I mean, some people outside of the state may not realize that in 2023, there are many communities in West Virginia without access to basic sanitation services or, or potable water. So um, the wastewater upgrades and, that have been made in our rural areas have not only provided that sanitation service, but that they've also made our rivers and streams safer to play in um, so that parents aren't worried about their kids getting serious bacterial infections by playing in the creek. Um, I, you know, the challenge remains uh, two things, and, I, and I, I'm glad to see Samantha here because I know she's leading the charge on this. To, to making sure that the communities that need the funding investments the most are being supported in terms of the capacity to attract that funding and administer that funding. So I'm talking about, you know, grant writing. <laughs> you know, we have counties in our, our uh, state where the same person who is driving the ambulance is also writing the grants for the county. So it's just that capacity building that I think I'm so glad to hear more and more investment and attention being brought to. And the other thing I always feel compelled to say um, is that, you know, the things that are happening around the Chesapeake Bay watershed and the amount of investment that's been made is needed and amazing and wonderful and producing results. However, you know, communities don't end at watersheds. <laughs> I have to speak for the other part of my state who don't have access to Chesapeake Bay program funding. Half of our state is in the Ohio River watershed. And since this is a region-wide um, summit today, is acknowledging that um, you know, not all communities or watersheds are valued in the same way. And I think we have to reckon with that. Thank you. Now I'll be using a lot of baseball analogies today. And so Mr. Abel, Mr. Levo, you're back in cleanup in this session. Clear the base, base is loaded. Come on, bring us in. All right, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, you're right, uh, Mr. Leggett, there, there has not been a, a ton of investment in the structural capacity at the community level. Um, there has been a really good amount of dollars that have been flowing to uh, large uh, institutions and organizations that uh, have tremendous capacity and they do decent work, uh, but uh, as soon as they leave town, th these efforts fizzle. So I think that the key to this all is access to funding. As Miss um, Wolverton stated, there's a ton of money uh, coming uh, that is available, but it is completely, and I mean that sincerely, completely inaccessible to community level organizations the process by way by which you need to go through to get that funding is impossible for many organizations to to navigate the SAM process alone it, it's it's a nightmare um going through um the, the the government portals um and you know there there are honest efforts underway to uh support organizations in their capacity to write grants, to navigate the process, but that doesn't change anything. The, the, the structure is still maintaining the club. They're still maintaining the club and that's not what we need. We need to change the club mentality so that we can have more access for people. And it doesn't matter who you know or what friends you've made or who favors that you've, you've been able to uh, you know, fall under good graces. The process is so uh, difficult to to navigate. It is virtually impossible for communities to get that um, access to those funds. So I hope that was a good cleanup. And this leads me to the, the, the next round of uh, questions. And, and let me tell you what I say, a view from the field, because we, over the last 30 years, we developed trust in over 60 communities throughout the Bay and what I found is people with resources many times don't have boots on the ground, feet in the creek, and don't have trust that when you pull up to a waterman's wharf or in some communities, they don't know whether you're from the CIADEA customs. Uh, who are these people to say we're here to help? 
So we have to find ways to connect with communities and not only formal leaders, but informal leaders. I was recently at a workshop that just talked about the inf infrastructure money and the bilateral money. And it was about 70 people in the room. And the question was asked, well, who's in SAMS.gov? who's in grants.gov, and it was three people left in the room. They told everyone else to go to another room. What that said to me, ladies and gentlemen, and those out on Zoom land is there's a pipeline issue that we need to figure out and really get some smart people in the room, but also people that are in the streets, in the communities, in the watersheds, because this is what I say, whether you are on Martin Luther King Boulevard in Virginia, DC, Baltimore, Washington, Pennsylvania, or if you are a postdoctorate, people can't find the on-ramp to the Bay Game. This is what I say. And I've been around this track 30 years and they see all the cars up on the freeway and said, Mr. Leggett, how do you get up there? What my Rolodex says is people work through their comfort levels, what organizations and entities have delivered in the past, kept the money straight, didn't get anybody in trouble. I think our tendency is to go back to people we've had success with. Well, if those people that we've had success with were not black, browns, or limited resource people, there's a barrier and a chasm. So what I think is if there are ways to do uh, joint ventures, collaboratives, mentor protege programs, and so people that have five-star charity ratings or gold stickers on their website can team with groups that are evolving, but also even while they're partnering, continue to build capacity. I see Mrs. Beer is there. I mean, we all know about the 8A programs. People kind of ride the 8A wagon for seven years. The eighth year, they try to get serious, and the ninth year, they're closed because they really were not building capacity while they were collaborating with these kind of programs. And so, if anyone wants to kind of dive into the deep end of the pool, I threw a few beach balls out there for you all to hit earlier. But now we're going to throw a few higher and inside and see who can press back from the plate or who wants to lean in. Uh, looks like Philip Beers is standing in the batter's box. Come on in. You know, I'm never afraid to take on a challenge. I think it's because I'm the third third girl in a row. You couldn't survive my household. <laughs> and, you, know, you think three boys is tough? Try three girls. So here's what here's all the frustrations that you're talking about. Look, I've been doing this work since 1992. All the frustrations you're talking about, I totally see and I get. I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that in this administration, we're standing at something called the Tic Tac Centers. These centers, and, and I'm, I'm proud to tell you that the Mid-Atlantic Region Tic Tac Center, we got $12 million. And Angie, music to your ears, we fought for the extra $2 million and got good results to do work in Appalachia. So the point of these centers is, is to be like the Brownfields Technical Assistance Centers, to meet community-based organizations where they are and provide capacity building support for these organizations so they understand the ridiculous amounts, and I said ridiculous, the ridiculous amounts of you got to get on this system and remember this passcode to even file for that. And you got to keep track of these 23 things if you're going to do a federal grant. We understand that this is difficult and daunting, and some of the groups out there that are doing the most important work don't have the keys to the kingdom, don't know how to do this work. So we're standing up these Tic Tac centers to be able to offer that support. Here in Region 3, the Mid-Atlantic Tic Tac, I said we got $12 million to fund these centers. It's West Virginia State University, together with Dr. Sakobi Wilson at University of Maryland College Park, the National Wildlife Federation. Many of us have worked with Mustafa Ali for many, many years. He's executive vice president there. And the Maryland Technical Assistance Center. So it's those four entities together are going to be providing the boots on the ground to help the local smaller community-based organizations figure out what grant are they interested in, how to fill out the grant applications, and perhaps most importantly, how do they build their own capacity within their organization so they know how to service a federal grant and can move forward. 
So in my office, Aaron Sullivan is the, is the project officer for the Tic Tac for the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, we expect those centers to be up and running mid-summer. You know, federal government, we like to talk in seasons. I'm thinking mid-summer means July. Don't hold us to it, July-ish. But you can always reach out and ask, what, where's the status? Who do I call? And I'm happy to connect you. Also this afternoon, you can listen to Dr. Wilson talking about his role in the Mid-Atlantic Tic Tac Center. I believe that session's at 245, 245. So we are going to be here to help you understand how do you access that money? Because it shouldn't just be based on your Rolodex. But guess what, Mr. Leggett? I am one of those Rolodexes too, based on many, many years of public service, collecting people's cards, putting them with the faces and calling. That is one method, but it shouldn't be the only method. So these centers are there to help build capacity. No such thing as a silly question. Reach out if you have some. Thank you. Next batter up. I can chime in on a, a sort of a, a different angle on the same challenge around um, flexibility of federal funding. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, all of the members of our advisory committee are volunteers. Um, some of us are fortunate to be able to be paid by our jobs while we serve. Um, others are fortunate to have achieved a comfortable retirement and serve as, as part of their uh, enjoying the rest of their, their later in life time. And others are truly missing out on uh, employment funds, uh, salaries and um, opportunities to work by serving. And if we want to make sure that we are including um, especially that category of voices, which I think are the most regularly left behind. Um, we've been seeking ways to provide stipends for participation and have run into, uh, and I'm not going to say that our committee was the first or the only to do this. I know that members within the Bay Program Partnership have been exploring this for as long as a decade, um, but we have run into numerous challenges trying to find ways of providing even a small stipend for participation. We also run into the challenge of while our accommodations are covered under the grant that supports the committee, um, our transportation to get there is only done by on a reimbursement basis. And we've had members who could not continue to participate because they couldn't afford the upfront cost of getting either renting a car because they don't have one or getting a train ticket and then waiting a month to be reimbursed. So I do think that even beyond community organization support, there's even expectations of um, the, uh, the cost that it incurs to be a volunteer and how might, as we provide this advice to our federal partners and the states, can those entities provide more financial support to the people serving. Thank you. And, and I know that the 30 years I've been around that I had to pretend to be a trust fund baby just to get admission to the club. And uh, again, I'm still little Vinny from East Baltimore, because if the meeting is at 12 after in the afternoon or two o'clock in the afternoon, people that are on the lines at the plants, picking, shucking, whatever they're doing, they can't participate. I had the blue blazer and I shined the buttons up before I went to the Board of Governors meetings, but I worked on jobs. If they didn't support Blacks of the Chesapeake, they tolerated it. And every now and then they would bring me into the woodshed and said, Vince, if you are as enthusiastic over the job we are paying you for, then the job that you have passion about, we all would be further down the line. Well, I'm closer to 70 than 60. I know I look good, but June 26, I'll be 70. And many times it's difficult to be sitting in a conference and you're the only volunteer around the table. Uh, my wife said, enough. Don't bring any more trophies home. Don't bring any crystal home. Bring cash. And so I think that I'm one of the more elite uh, volunteers because I had a home and jobs that support it because we were trying to bring voice to blacks and browns and limited resource people to improve the quality of life on the Chesapeake Bay because so many people still look at our bay as a playground for the rich. They don't see their face in the pictures. You go to colleges, universities, public libraries, flip books on the Chesapeake Bay. You don't see people that look like you, look like me, look like us, black, brown, and limited resource of any hue. 
And so again, these are some of the challenges facing us. We have a couple of our questions that kind of come into the chat and people can kind of dive in. They hear a lot of buzz about electric cars, electric boats, solar, wind power, uh, these uh, avenues that people can engage in in meaningful ways. Anybody have any interest or experience around uh, those kinds of issues? Okay. Question about the um, uh, microplastics. Okay. And and toxicity related to um, uh, using uh, uh, tire rubber. Okay. So in, in children's playgrounds. So we're combining a couple of themes that showed up in the type around you know wastewater treatment plants, plastics, recycling plastics, landfills airborne particles uh, that are not just, and, and I heard again, our uh, channel, Ms. Philip Beers, about cumulative impact. I mean, we've been in so many sessions. If you have seven landfills in your community and someone has an application for the eighth, the review and re regulatory body say, well, we can't talk about the seven. We're just talking about the one in front of us. And again, I know that there've been legislative initiatives around uh, finding ways to address cumulative impact. So again, I'm just sampling, kind of throwing out some things and see if any of you all bite uh, Phillips beers. So I'm starting to feel like an el elder statesman um, just, just through the, the years I've been doing this. So in the mid 1990s, in an effort to better understand the burden on the community in Chester, uh, Reg Harris, Reggie Harris, who many of you, I know you know Vince, but other people may yes. have you call. Uh, uh, he helped write the statement of work for the very first cumulative impact analysis done in America with a, we used a contract vehicle to get John Hopkins on board. I know you're a Baltimore guy, so you love that one. So mm -hmm. we did draft that. And from that day on, Re Reg, who just retired in December, and I've been sort of working the legal and the talk side of what is cumulative impact analysis? What does it look like and how do you do it? So I'm really excited to say that here in Region 3, we have been doing it for 20 years. We have been helping to inform the national effort led by Charles Lee. Charles is a longtime EJ advocate. He used to be with the United Church of Christ and wrote the original study, mm -hmm. Dumping on Dixie, in 1987. Mm -hmm. So Charles is a yeah. long-term EJ advocate who's joined our headquarters office uh, 12 or 15 years ago, dropping the bucket. But he's been in this mm -hmm. game a long time. So EPA is now working on formalizing rules around what does cumulative impact analysis look like. And I think it's an answer for many of us because it can provide a roadmap to what are the things that are causing the injustice in that community where there's a clear linkage between an environmental issue condition or, or, or release and deleterious public health effects. So cumulative impact analysis is one tool. The question seems to center a little bit more around children's health. I do run the Children's Health Program for US EPA Region 3. Erin Sullivan, who you heard me mention before, is the Children's Health Region 3 lead. Fabulous. She has her master's in public health and is interested in cumulative impact analysis and health impact mm -hmm. analysis. So if you've got a specific issue you're concerned about, if you're living in a heat island area with a lot of paved service and your issue is these turf playgrounds, reach back out to us and we'll see what, if anything, we can help in connecting you back with our state partners any local partners, as well as information we may have. Because cumulative impact analysis will get us to the very heart of where your, your community health may be impacted. And you'd be surprised the type of inputs we have to put in to figure out where that driver is. And then to figure out what, if anything, communities can do to help protect themselves while we're working on a bigger picture. I love the area of cumulative impact. Don't even pull that string. I could go on forever. <laughs> Anybody else want to dive in? Yes. I'll do, yes, I'll, you know, when you start talking about toxins and cumulative impacts in public health, um, on the forefront of our, our work in our minds in West Virginia is the PFAS issue. Um, I, I mean, it looms large and it's going to be a huge challenge um, to deal with. And it's also a huge opportunity for community yeah. engagement, yeah. Um, particularly in our Chesapeake Bay watershed of the state. We have a large concentration of PFAS contamination. Um, impacting elementary schools and VA centers. Um, I know there's a workshop later on the regulatory side of PFAS, but 
we're um, we're gearing up and, and it seems like an all hands deck situation for the whole region on how to communicate uh, risk communication with communities and also make sure that we are doing our darndest to reduce PFAS at its source while also getting the funding and treatment in place to protect public health in the immediate. It's, it's a both and equation um, that we're all gonna have to work together aggressively on. Well, we have the top of the ticket. We're coming down the back stretch. I'd like to give each person just one minute to just uh, give me your closing arguments. You just got mine, so I'll pass okay. it in. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, well, um, I guess in terms of closing remarks, you know, environmental justice and a focus on trying to think about how to tailor our programs and the benefits of those programs to more immediately affect the communities on the ground is, I mean, that's a key interest. That's kind of the point of the work. It can often be a challenge to connect the dots between those of us who, you know, work in government and the people on the ground and the communities that benefit from these, particularly when you're talking about things that are spearheaded from you know the national from a national agency but that's kind of the point there's a lot of money and grants there's a lot of efforts going on to um integrate environmental justice into the fabric of what the agency does on a day-to-day -day basis and so if you have an interest in um you know talking further or in thinking about the way that the project that patrick and i described could be kind of realized in a way that would be more immediately useful. We'd love to hear about that. Um, and then more broadly, you know, just um, know that the EPA is striving to do better on, on this front. And um, if there are ample opportunities to give your advice and um, feedback on how we can do that better more broadly as well. So um, I guess I'll stop there. Sure Thank you. To talk next. Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in um, just because I think that uh, uh, going off of you know the, um, the 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 themes or the idea that there's a lot of resources available, um, I think that people should recognize also that the communities that we work with or try to engage don't have the luxury of spending times at 2 p.m. meetings. They don't have opportunities to take that master naturalist class. Their priority is food on the table, rent or mortgage, getting to work and, and family. So when we ask of their time, of their participation, we're asking, we're literally taking food out of their mouths. So we need to know that the work that we do is not their priority. Their priority is something else. And that is okay. We just need to think about how to structure our approach that incorporates or involves or overlays their priorities, or at least allows them to address their own priorities. That's work, workforce development, that's opportunities to be self-sufficient, uh, paying them for their time. There's lots of ways that we can take uh, the work and, and the goals and, and, and improving the, the, the environment uh, and overlay in, in, in our center the priorities of the communities that we, we want or need to serve um, and as another point, it is incredibly expensive to have a sick populace. So if, it, if anything else, you know, you, you look at um, uh, decision makers, funders, et cetera, and you tell them these conditions are making people sick for the long term. Cancer, asthma, heart disease, diabetes, chronic diseases cost money, a lot of money, more money than, than we have here. So it, we got to do it because it's the right thing to do, but also decision makers, it's going to cost you money. So, I mean, I don't want to be crass, but that former lobbyist in me is telling me people pay attention to the money. Um, and I'll leave it with that. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Somebody else want to just weigh in? So I want to I want to jump a little bit on, on a couple of the things I'm hearing. You're right. People do pay attention to money. So we're at a once in a lifetime opportunity here. You have to go back to the depression to start talking about the federal government putting this sort of money into the economy. And part of what I've done in my 20, what, 31 years at EPA is trying to make sure that folks that look like me have an opportunity to even know the money's there, right? 
So no matter what other jobs I've had, I've had EJ as a continuant in all my other federal jobs, whether I was doing enforcement, compliance, whatever it is, I always thought about the communities that we serve. And I want to make sure that folks know about this unprecedented opportunity that the Biden administration is putting out there, as well as here in Region 3, we're really lucky. Our regional administrator is a guy named Adam Ortiz. He's from Maryland, lives in Maryland, and he's fully dedicated to the Bay and making a difference for all the people in the Bay. And Angie knows, how often do we go down to West Virginia, Angie? She's getting tired of me. I swear to God, she is. I know Scott is probably getting tired of me from West Virginia DEP. But what we're trying to do is get out and hear from people and understand where they are at times that they can talk to us. Because I hear you, Abel, on, on, on folks and what they're doing in the environment and putting food on the table. But in my years of doing EJ, some of that food on the table is coming from the streams. So we need to make sure that folks know what's in the stream and that we can better advise them and that we can do our job to see whether or not that fish is, is edible and at what degrees and in what language do we need to talk about. It. So mm -hmm. we have this unprecedented okay. opportunity. Okay. We need to access it. We need to formulate longstanding relationships and partnerships. And we need to recognize that this is our chance, our chance, not my chance, not your chance, but our chance. So let's try to do some stuff together and make permanent change. Let's raise the basement. Well, we're uh, all the saying is ran out of the hourglass. I think we used it very efficiently. Uh, our Blacks of the Chesapeake has a tagline and a bumper sticker that says, this bay is your bay and this bay is our bay. And so you can just reach out to us on the chat line and uh, get one of these bumper stickers because I think that that is a message. It's your bay, it's our bay, it's all of our bay. And whether you... Uh, can see the water from your view shed or your upstream or on Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's all connected. I just want to thank the panelists. I want to thank everyone out there on Zoom land. I want to thank Matt Robinson, my co-partner, and my administrator, Dee Dee Strum, and uh, enjoy your day. And for me, God bless.